Fracopoly describes how the fracking industry began, the technologies that make it possible. The book also examines the powerful interests that have supported fracking, including leading environmental groups. With a wealth of new data, Fracopoly is essential and riveting reading for anyone interested in protecting the environment and ensuring a healthy and sustainable future for all Americans. Author Winona Howder is the executive director of Food and Watch Water, Food and Water Watch, excuse me, DC-based watchdog organization focused on corporate and government accountability relating to food, water, and fishing. She has also worked and written extensively on food, water, energy, and environmental issues at the national, state, and local levels. She owns a working farm in the Plains, Virginia. Let's give her a nice round of applause. Winona Howder. Well, thanks so much for coming out tonight. So I want to do um, three things this evening. I want to talk about why I wrote Fracopoly, a little bit about what fracking actually is, and then some of the history to the oil and gas industry and how we've ended up with an industry so powerful that it's basically deciding on whether we're going to have a planet that, we, that is livable in the future. So I always like Machiavelli quote, uh, we do need to know where we've been to know where we're going. So one of the reasons I wrote Fracopoly is that although since 2012, 80% of fracking has been for oil, we know that it's fracking for natural gas, that the industry is justifying uh, it for the future. And it turns out that we really need to do something about climate change in the next 10 to 15 years and the emissions going into our atmosphere. We hear a lot about carbon, which is a greenhouse gas that's in the atmosphere for a very long time. But methane, which is what natural gas is, is a much potenter greenhouse gas. In fact, about 86 times more potent. And although it's not in the atmosphere as long, for about uh, 20 years or less, uh, in the short term, that makes it a very dangerous a greenhouse gas for our climate. And we do not believe the evidence shows that natural gas is not a bridge fuel. The other reason that I wrote Fracopoly is, you know, in the mid-1990s, I worked on a renewable energy project in the Midwestern United States, 12 states. We showed that renewables were cost effective then for renewable energy. And there was actually quite a move uh, to move into renewable electricity. But as you can see, a lot of the things that happened since then have kept renewables from moving forward at the pace that they should. Uh, notice that solar and wind together are over 5% in 2015. I think that's a stunning figure, and it's shameful. And especially when we look at a state like Florida, uh, the sunshine state, why are we developing natural gas when there's so much sunshine here? Oops, getting used to the technology. Uh, the other thing that really drove me to write Fracopoly is the people being impacted by fracking operations. 17 million people live within a, million, within a mile of a fracking operation. And Kim from Pennsylvania uh, is an example of the kind of person who has been really impacted. She owned a house. Uh, she was living very close to a fracking operation. She couldn't sell her house. So uh, her water was ruined. She didn't want her daughter exposed to the chemicals. So she left her house uh, and all of the money that she had put into it. That's the way people's lives are being impacted on the front lines of fracking. Randy Moyer uh, was a worker in Pennsylvania. He drove a wastewater truck. And he had to clean out the truck and uh, also the, the pits where the wastewater was being dumped. He is now very, very ill, and in fact, his health is ruined, and he's speaking out. In fact, the oil and gas industry is one of the most 
dangerous industries to work for when you look at worker deaths and um, injuries. Why don't we wait till the end and then I'll take some questions. So let me explain for anyone who's not familiar with the technologies used for fracking what it actually is. First of all, a vertical well is drilled, um, often goes two miles or deeper, and then a horizontal tunnel is drilled. Now the vertical well, that's very typical for conventional drilling, but the ability to drill this uh, horizontal tunnel is one of the new technologies that's come together that's allowing fracking to take place. Then a mixture of water, chemicals, and very uh, fine silica sand are mixed together, and they're injected under very high pressure in a series of stages to break apart the shale. Most fracking today is in a very t hard type of rock shale, and uh, there are other uh, types of hard rock like type sandstone uh, that fracking can also be used. Fracking is also being used in some conventional wells where the easy to get to fossil fuels are gone and they're fracking to get deeper and to have access to more either oil or gas. Now, one of the things that is really uh, distressing about this is the amount of water that's being used. 50 times more water on average than conventional drilling. The national average per well is 1.7 million gallons. But in some states, for instance, Texas, uh, they use 13 million gallons in some of the wells. So, and of course, um, much of the fracking is in very dry areas of the country. Uh, places like Southern California, Colorado, and Texas, not like Florida. One of the things that happens with fracking is that when the chemicals and the sand and the water are injected and it breaks apart the rock, uh, new pathways are created, and often even the casing, the well casing, is impacted. In fact, this has always been a problem in the oil and gas industry. They are always uh, cutting costs and taking shortcuts. And so many times the casing actually breaks. And the methane um, is sometimes released into drinking water aquifers. And deep underground, two miles underground, the new pathways that are being formed, we don't really know what happens to uh, much of this wastewater. The other thing that happens with fracking is that it's not just the toxic chemicals that are used in the uh, water and sand and chemical mix. Um, deep underground, there are all sorts of brines and liquids. Uh, they have, uh, it has radioactive materials and other chemicals that really aren't meant to come back to the surface, and that's all mixed with this wastewater. So every day the oil and gas industry generates about 10.5 billion gallons of wastewater. That's an average figure. That's a lot of wastewater that has to be dealt with. It also means that a lot of fresh water is being uh, polluted. Uh, this is Colorado. Uh, each state regulates how the wastewater is being disposed of. In this particular case, these are evaporation ponds. Uh, the, waste, the water is evaporated off, and then the, the solids, uh, the sludge, is hauled to a facility. Of course, these ponds leak, and even the licensed facilities aren't really inspected very often, and there are a lot of problems uh, with those as well. Now, there's another problem with wastewater disposal. And you may have heard, in fact, uh, about three weeks ago, uh, there was a major earthquake in Oklahoma. So one of the ways that wastewater is disposed of is it's injected deep underground under high pressure called deep disposal wells. 
Well, more and more of the waste, larger volumes under greater pressure are being disposed of. And one of the things that's happening is that it's causing earthquakes. Uh, and actually, the US Geologic Service has documented that it's fracking wastewater, uh, this deep well uh, disposal that's causing earthquakes. Oklahoma is a good example of um, these earthquakes. Before the fracking boom um, that really started there 2008, 2009, they had one to three 3.0 magnitude earthquakes a year. Last year, 2015, they had 857 over uh, 3.0 magnitude earthquakes. And if you count the lesser earthquakes, there were more than 5,000. And these earthquakes are now occurring in lots of places where this deep well disposal is being used, including uh, California has deep well, uh, has these uh, deep well disposal uh, facilities that are causing quite a lot of controversy there. Of course, the roadways, there are lots of uh, uh, ways that, impact, that earthquakes are impacting uh, where they're occurring. Of course, in Oklahoma, most of the places where the earthquakes are happening are rural areas. But you can imagine uh, if this happened in an urban area. Another thing that is happening with uh, wastewater is that in California, oil and gas wastewater is being used to irrigate uh, crops. And uh, at Food and Water Watch, we did an investigation of some of the uh, companies that are actually using uh, wastewater on some of their crops. This is just a few of them. Um, and of course, when the organic standards were developed, um, wastewater was not being used uh, to irrigate. So the organic standards at this point don't um, uh, cover oil and gas wastewater. Just a few more of the, uh, the brands. The other thing that happens um, around fracking operations is the air pollution. And in fact, it's the air pollution that makes many people sick, the bloody noses, the asthma, uh, the nausea, the skin rashes. And uh, where there is fracking going on, there are all sorts of processing and compressor facilities. And this is just a few of the chemicals that uh, can be emitted uh, at those facilities. Another impact are the pipelines. And uh, you know, here in Florida, there's a major pipeline uh, being built from central Florida up north and then into uh, Georgia. There are literally thousands of miles of new infrastructure being developed for natural gas today. And the big banks are uh, investing in this infrastructure as much as $300 billion. And why that's really distressing is it means that there are plans to continue using fossil fuels for another 40 years. And look at the amount of pipelines. Um, this 2.5 million miles uh, of gas, that's just gas, uh, that's a way undercount because every state regulates the non-interstate pipelines. And there are many, many pipelines that have been and are being built from the well, uh, wellhead to the interstate uh, gas pipeline. So we know that this is uh, uh, quite an undercount. Another impact is what it does to the countryside. So the rural areas of the country, and this, by the way, is also taking place in urban areas uh, like uh, Fort Worth, Texas, Dallas, Texas. There is drilling going on, uh, in fact, even in uh, Los Angeles County. Um, but in the countryside where we would expect that our food is being grown, in many states, there are now fracking operations. And there's fracking going on in about 30 states. Of course, some of the rigs uh, are not drilling right now because the price of oil and gas is low. But we must realize, and in fact, one of the things that I found in researching the history of the oil and gas industry is this is a very typical pattern. 
boom, bust, boom, bust. That's really the history of the oil and gas industry. And we already begin to see prices going up. So do we want our rural countryside to become industrialized, or do we want to, um, to really have a, a plan for growing healthier, uh, more local, more uh, regionally produced food? One of the uh, ways that the countryside is industrialized is all of the vehicle traffic. Every one of those wells that I was talking about and a, a, a well pad may have as many as six or eight wells. Each single well takes a thousand truckloads on average of materials. So this is a picture from Pennsylvania. You can imagine if you lived in one of these rural areas that has very poor regulation, um, the traffic, the accidents, the um, problems for the road, really um, many, many problems. Another impact that's happening in a few states is the mining of the silica sand. There are only a handful of states that have this really fine white sand. Uh, you can see the Mississippi River there in the background. Uh, the states are Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, where most of this mining is being done. These, there were some small silica mines, but now they have expanded dramatically. You can imagine if you uh, live in one of these rural areas and this huge mine is developed, and the silica sand uh, causes a disease, silicosis, that's very similar to the lung disease caused by asbestos. So there are a lot of, a lot of impacts. And then there are the accidents. There are literally hundreds of blowouts every year. And again, very difficult to track because most of these things are tracked at the state level. And um, sometimes there will be a big article if it's a big spill, this is one in uh, North Dakota. And I use this slide because you can actually see how widespread the damage is. Uh, but a lot of times in greener areas, it's uh, more difficult to see how big the spills are. And then there are the train accidents for the fracked oil. And of course, a lot of the fracked oil is coming from North Dakota. And it's being hauled by train car. Of course, these trains and the train tracks aren't really designed for the level of traffic and the um, accidents that happen. This, was, this happened in June in Oregon. It actually sent some of the pollution into the Columbia River. But there are many train accidents happening now. Um, we really worry because these trains go through some of our biggest urban cities, Philadelphia, New York, Chicago. Uh, what happens if one of these oil trains um, has an accident in one of those urban areas? We're talking about really widespread uh, damage. Um, so just another one of the impacts. I am going to turn now that I've kind of given the 101 on why um, at Food and Water Watch we're not a fan of fracking. Um, but I want to turn a now to the history of the oil and gas industry because I, that was one of the most interesting things um, that I really learned in writing Fracopoly. How did we really get to this situation? So I always like to start with Thomas Jefferson, because uh, Thomas Jefferson um, wanted to put into the Bill of Rights the freedom to be free of monopolies. And of course, the other gentleman there is Alexander Hamilton, who was closely aligned with the big banks. and. Um, uh, New York financial interests. And um, so the freedom from monopolies did not get in the Bill of Rights. But since that time, many times over the course of our nation's history, there has been a debate about antitrust law and the role of monopolized 
power uh, in our politics. Now, I don't think Thomas Jefferson was worried about consumer prices, right? He was worried about political power. And what happens when companies, uh, corporate interest, economic interest, get so large that they can actually buy public policy, which we know um, is um, the case today. And when we look at what's happened since the 1980s, we've had enormous consolidation in every industry. And I think it's always interesting to look at the interlocking boards of directors. I wrote a book on food industry and did the same thing. There are uh, boards that, uh, corporate boards, and the um, directorships tend to be by a group of people who serve on one another's boards. Now, one of the places that I think we can see a real impact on our democracy is the media. I mean, to me, with the threat from climate change every day, it should be on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, it should be on uh, every TV channel. We should be talking about what we need to do to reduce emissions, uh, use energy efficiency as a bridge fuel, and really turn to renewable energy. And of course, we don't. And when you look at when this consolidation really started uh, snowballing in the mid-1980s, even then, uh, we still had 50 large media organizations. Today, we have six. So it's very difficult if you're someone who only gets your news from the mainstream media to really know about some of the most important issues of the day, uh, including what's happening um, to our global climate. And I think here, when we're talking about um, the fracking companies, we know that the financial services industry is very deep into uh, maintaining the status quo with fossil fuels. So there are a lot of reasons to be concerned about the opoly part of fracopoly. So this is John D. Rockefeller. Most of us know who he is. We learned about him in high school or college. We learned that he rolled up the oil industry by 1890. Of course, in those days, oil was used for kerosene. Nobody had uh, electric lights, and they needed kerosene to light their homes. So they were very, very angry that the price of kerosene was very high, and that Rockefeller uh, was running all of the independent companies out of business and was in cahoots with the trains who hauled um, kerosene uh, around the country. So. Most of us know that by the time that Teddy Roosevelt was elected, in just the first uh, decade of the 20th century, that enough pressure had built that one of the things that he did was sue a number of the trusts. And of course, Rockefeller's trust was Standard Oil. Um, I really like this uh, from Puck. This is a, uh, a picture. Puck was a very popular magazine of this period. Here you can see the tentacles of Standard Oil around the White House and around state capitals. Now, we also learned in our history classes that uh, Standard Oil was broken up and everything was fine after that. It was a happy story. Well. That's not quite what happened. So it is true that Standard Oil was required to change its business model, but the directors of Standard Oil were given the ability to write their own plan for how Standard Oil would be broken up. And uh, that meant that Rockefeller and the other directors who met every day for lunch in Manhattan, even after, Standard Oil was broken up. They devised a way to really um, keep their control of the baby standards. And in fact, one baby standard actually ended up with half of the value of standard trust. That was uh, Standard of New Jersey. Uh, after this, we're going to use their modern names. 
So that was Exxon. And uh, Standard Oil of California, Chevron. Standard Oil of New York, Mobile. For those of you old enough to remember that Mobile and um, Exxon merged um, during the Clinton administration. These other companies on the right also formed about the same time. And uh, we don't have to get into each one, but they used the uh, trust model. These companies were called the Seven Sisters. Now, if you had Greek mythology, you'll know this reference. The Seven Sisters were Atlas's daughters. And they hated each other and fought unless one of them was attacked. And then they all rallied around to protect her. And that's kind of the history uh, of the oil and gas industry. Now, I have this uh, slide because these seven companies were major oil companies, are still major oil companies. That means that they controlled every aspect of production, uh, transportation, um, and retail, every aspect of uh, selling, drilling, and then selling the final product. So there were more companies than this, but these were the, the companies with the most political power. Now, in 1928, uh, these companies um, were really concerned when oil was found in Iraq. And here on the left, uh, you will see the head of the three largest of the seven sisters, uh, Exxon, uh, Shell, and BP. And the presidents of these companies, the heads of these companies, had all along been conspiring uh, amongst themselves with the other companies about how to keep down production, wanted low production, high prices. And they had this kind of alliance. Well, once oil was discovered in Iraq, lots and lots and lots of oil, they were really concerned. So they met at this castle in Scotland to write out a set of principles by which they would operate in the coming decades about how to keep production low and to boost prices and how the uh, industry would operate. Now, this was discovered, actually, in 1952. This meeting was in 1928. But periodically, our federal government, in this case the Federal Trade Association, investigated uh, the bad behavior, the criminal behavior of the oil and gas industry. And in this particular investigation, uh, there were 30,000 pages of testimony, and the uh, companies were required to open their books. And this secret meeting and their set of principles were discovered. Now, one of the things that happened to kind of limit the power a bit of um, industry happened under the Roosevelt administration. We know there was a depression. Um, there was a lot of bad behavior by a lot of industries, including the electric industry. And so under the Roosevelt administration, there was some protective legislation that passed to limit the size of electric utilities. Now, I'm mentioning this because in a few minutes, I'm going to talk about when this protective legislation was repealed because it's had a major effect on energy today and um, how the electric industry has teamed up with the, uh, the gas industry. So uh, that's Franklin Roosevelt signing uh, this Public Utility Holding Company Act of 1935 that limited the size of electric utilities to a, a contiguous service territory, said that they had to open their books to the Securities and Exchange Commission, said they couldn't gamble with their ratepayer uh, money like they had, um, one of the things that brought on the Depression and, and a number of other things. You can imagine that the electric industry was mad. They spent the next several decades trying to repeal this. Now, at the same time, a few years later, still under Roosevelt and before World War II started, the gas industry was regulated. 
And that was because the gas industry was cheating consumers in the parts of the country that used gas for heating. And so the Natural Gas Act of 1938 was passed, and it gave the Federal Power Commission the right to set the price of natural gas and uh, oversight over pipelines. And uh, that really limited the amount of uh, misbehavior that the uh, oil and gas industry engaged in uh, related to gas. And you can imagine the industry was very angry about this legislation. Now, World War II came along, and it's worth mentioning that a lot of the technologies that were developed for winning the war also benefited uh, the, the gas, oil and gas industry naturally, like being able to do really long distance pipes. This, um, these two pipelines were actually the largest project uh, that the U.S. engaged in during World War II in the United States. It took 16 million men to build this pipeline that took fuel from Texas. Uh, one of them took fuel uh, from Texas up to uh, Chicago. The other one went to Chicago and then veered off to the Northeast. These were privatized after the war and are still being used today uh, for natural gas. Now, there was a big fight that went on over how fossil fuels and electricity were used. Should it be for the benefit of Americans, uh, Americans or should it be for the benefit of the industry? And there were people on both sides of this, but Congress was very engaged in the decades after World War II, both in investigating the industry uh, and then there were others like Senator Robert Kerr who were engaged in trying to cheat uh, American consumers. Uh, Bob Kerr, a senator from Oklahoma, he had been uh, the governor of Oklahoma. He owned a very large uh, oil company, uh, which has been bought by Anna Darko today. And he spent his 15 years in Congress until he died in 1963 advocating for the oil and gas industry, some fun things like the golden gimmick that is a tax break for uh, companies that operate in Saudi Arabia, or the depletion allowance, which is a tax break for the oil and gas industry when they drill. Uh, they get a break for what they actually take out of, um, out of the ground. And actually today, most of these big companies um, don't pay any federal taxes uh, because of all of the uh, uh, loopholes. And um, this brings us up to Richard Nixon, who did a number of things, including opening up uh, the, um, the coastal areas of the country to drilling. And uh, he also appointed a number of people into important positions that in the following decades um, were leading advocates of, of deregulating and getting rid of a lot of the rules that, uh, that did exist for the oil and gas industry. Another thing that Richard Nixon did, and I think this is kind of an important marker in what's happened to our democracy, he appointed Lewis Powell to the Supreme Court. Um, Lewis Powell made the first decision uh, around giving corporations uh, the right of political speech. But I think that Powell did something even uh, more important than that, or that had a bigger mark on, has left a bigger mark to our nation. And he was a tobacco uh, lawyer. He was a corporate lawyer from Richmond, Virginia, very much opposed to many of the things that were happening in the 1960s and uh, early 1970s, opposed to the Civil Rights Act, opposed to um, the Warren Court and the Warren Court's expansion of rights to new classes of people, um, opposed to the organizing and the uh, political outrage around the Vietnam War. And um, he really detested what he uh, viewed as liberal values 
didn't like the youth culture. And so he and a number of his uh, colleagues from the Chamber of Commerce got together, and he wrote out this 15-page memo, this is just the first few words, about how the nation um, could be taken back um, from these liberal values. And he wrote out a plan that um, really has been pretty successful. And you can, I won't go all into this, but I think it's worth looking it up on your browser if you're not familiar with the Powell Memo or the Powell uh, Manifesto. Because he lays out how um, the institutions that he thought had been hijacked by these, um, by these liberals could be taken back. And he was referring to the media, uh, universities, uh, the pulpit, um, any major uh, institution that was involved in any of these activities that he and his uh, colleagues were opposed to. And more importantly, he then went out and raised the money to begin doing this. He went to some of the wealthiest families in the nation, the Koch families, our family, um, the core family of Colorado, the Scaife Mellon family of Pittsburgh, <coughs> Gulf Oil, uh, a number of families, and started raising money to, uh, uh, to basically create a whole wide range of right-wing institutions and think tanks that could get their message out. So I don't want to belabor this, but involved in this whole strategy was the oil and gas industry. And I think it's one of the things that's really hijacked uh, our democracy and let the things that are going on uh, today uh, really come to fruition. This is just one uh, quote from, uh, from that 15-page uh, memo. So what does this all meant? Well, for the oil and gas industry, it means that there has been a lot of reconsolidation. <laughs> So these are the original seven sisters, and each one of these lines is a merger or acquisition, but it represents many other mergers and acquisitions because all of these uh, companies were fairly large. And um, so this really represents what are hundreds of mergers and acquisitions that have left us with some of the biggest and most powerful major oil companies today. And um, this has happened over a long period of time, the last uh, three or four uh, decades. Many of these mergers happened. And some of the policies that have, let us, have led us into this uh, era today uh, with fracking really uh, uh, began with the uh, um, Carter administration. So there was a, an oil crisis uh, in the 1970s, and um, so there was a lot of interest in um, having independent oil and gas and energy produced in the U.S. So a lot of the uh, uh, research on alternative energy was done at this time, but also a lot of the policy changes were made that have uh, really uh, helped develop the structure of the industry today. So this is Jimmy Carter signing an Energy Act that allowed um, the creation of a new agency, the Department of Energy. Uh, the Department of Energy was basically uh, created to take all of the uh, pieces of energy uh, research and development uh, and regulation that was being done by the federal government and putting it in one agency. And it also um, allowed for the creation of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that for those of you who are working on fracking today are probably familiar with, that's the agency that um, regulates pipelines, power lines, and liquefied natural gas plants, an agency that really has never seen an oil and gas uh, and electric project that it didn't love. So a lot of this happened under 
began under the Carter administration, administration, natural gas was deregulated at this time. And much of the research that's allowed fracking really uh, took off during this period. Now, this is a list, just some of the research that our tax dollars have paid for. In the uh, big print, um, is some of the research that really took place early on, because beginning in 1908, uh, there was pressure from the oil and gas industry to actually um, allow the research to be conducted, uh, to be guided by the, by the industry. And many of these smaller uh, pieces of uh, research have um, enabled fracking, because the research that um, is used today really started uh, at the Department of Energy. Now, the deregulation that I was talking about, that chart that uh, showed uh, how much um, consolidation that there was in the industry, a lot of that began in the 1980s under the Reagan administration because um, when President Reagan was elected president, his supporters, the, his largest contributors, were interested in getting rid of antitrust law. That's Robert Bork uh, next to President Reagan. He, uh, President Reagan uh, tried to appoint him to the Supreme Court and was, he was defeated, but I think he had just as large an um, impact on public policy because he was a scholar, a legal scholar, who did not believe in antitrust law. He believed that monopolies were efficient. And after the Reagan administration, in fact, during the Reagan administration, the two agencies that oversee uh, antitrust law were greatly changed. Their budgets cut, lawyers fired, and probably most importantly, the definition of an antitrust violation was very, very greatly narrowed. So we've seen very little interest since the 1980s into really doing anything about antitrust. And it's not just the oil and gas industry. It's just about every industry that you look at. You know, we have a few dominant, dominant companies in every major industry. And I always like to pick on both parties. But uh, I will say that the decisions are made about antitrust and the failure to really, what I would say, properly regulate uh, the size of um, corporations, um, there's been agreement in both political parties on this issue. And a lot of the things that facilitated fracking uh, and the mergers happened under uh, the Clinton administration. The, deregulation of financial services of the big banks by the, uh, federal, um, the um, federal um, Energy Modernization Act, deregulation of electricity, the uh, free trade agreements. The, the major mergers happened under the Clinton administration. And then things started really snowballing. Uh, with the Energy Policy Act of 2005. By this time, the technologies to allow fracking had been developed. The industry was very interested in greatly expanding fracking around the country and, in fact, around the world. And when Vice President Cheney put together an energy task force that was comprised of the industry, some of the things that they came up with have really facilitated what we're living with today. So um, many of us are familiar with the Halliburton loophole. Of course, um, Dick Cheney worked for the big energy services company that does a lot of the fracking for the majors. Uh, he was a CEO. So that loophole exempts the oil and gas industry from the Safe Drinking Water Act. Two of the lesser known um, repeals um, and policy changes, though, were if you remember back to when I was talking about that 
um, regulation, set of regulations for the electric utility industry that was passed in uh, 1935 under FDR. These were repealed, allowing the electric industry to become very differently structured than it was before. Uh, rather than electric utilities being, uh, most electric utilities being focused mostly on providing electricity, um, either generating or buying energy for their consumers, this, um, the repeal of this law has created well, about 20 giant uh, energy companies that produce about 50% of electricity and engage in lots of other businesses, including uh, trading in energy futures uh, and many other businesses, uh, sometimes with their ratepayer uh, money. Uh, the other thing that happened is that that Ener Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, was given greatly expanded powers. It was given the power over to oversee one of our nation's most important environmental laws, uh, the National um, Environmental Policy Act, which requires that when there's a big project being developed that there has to be an environmental assessment. Now FERC uh, oversees that process, hiring the consultants, and then uh, determining whether the assessment means the project can go forward. And almost every project always goes forward. Uh, and then the other thing that FERC was given power over was um, condemning land for uh, building pipelines and uh, electric lines. It can overrule states now and localities. And then now uh, that brings us to the Obama administration. And unfortunately, the Obama administration has uh, not been as strong on these issues, and in fact is very much a proponent of natural gas and this above strategy where every kind of energy um, is being promoted. And uh, it, the federal agencies under his leadership have not done what they should do. The water investigations, uh, the water pollution investigations in Pennsylvania, uh, Texas, and Wyoming, in fact, were closed down uh, prior to his, um, his last um, uh, election and have not been restarted. Um, EPA has just done a very shoddy job at looking at these issues. And so we're left with uh, 20 jobs that do uh, most of the fracking and so those uh, uh, four major oil companies and I think the takeaway from this is they really the, the rules and the lack of rules uh, during the 20th century that applied oil and gas. And in this consolidated state, they have an oversized uh, influence on public policy related to energy. And one of the interesting things that's come out, in fact, just in the last uh, uh, couple months, some uh, documents that have um, been discovered by the international um, or by the um, Center for International Environmental Law suddenly had a moment of forgetting their uh, seal. They, as a product of some litigation, came across a number of really interesting documents that show that beginning in um, 1946, the American Petroleum Institute, which is the major lobbying arm of the oil and gas industry established in the, uh, the, the uh, 1918, um, they began meeting because they were concerned about regulation for environmental hazards. The committee was called the Smoke and Fumes Committee. It continued to meet and actually hired uh, many reputable scientists on a range of studies about the impacts of fossil fuels. By the mid-1950s, it turns out, they were aware of climate change. And in 1968, there was um, a, a set of studies came out that actually laid out what the future would be, the melting ice caps, 
the loss of species, uh, the rising oceans, all of the things that we know are happening today. The oil and gas industry knew and uh, kept it secret. And in fact, it turns out we always hear about the tobacco industry's playbook because they did the same thing. It turns out that the tobacco industry took their playbook from the oil and gas industry. And like I said, this is pretty, this is an explosive as far as I'm concerned and should really be on the front page of the New York Times. And they should be uh, um, really investigated and, and taken to court um, for this behavior. But um, we have a lot of work to do uh, ahead of us. Um, the good news is that we have had a lot of victories in our movement. And of course, there's a lot more that we need to do. And um, I want to end by just saying a few things about what's happened. And then Michelle's going to stand up briefly. Michelle Allen, who is the Food and Water Watch organizer in Florida, to talk about fracking in Florida for a few minutes. But this is uh, um, one of the major uh, rallies that we had in New York. Of course, New York is uh, the state that first banned fracking. We were very involved in that battle at Food and Water Watch. We were the first national organization to call for a ban on fracking. And it was uh, a very exciting four-year campaign. Um, and of course, uh, Maryland uh, now has a moratorium in, on fracking. Vermont uh, banned fracking. This is a campaign in um, California. And there are campaigns happening in numerous states across the nation. And this was a, um, a really exciting event. Uh, the day before the Democratic Convention, uh, 10,000 people marched in Philadelphia uh, in 100 degree temperature. Uh, we were one of the organizers. And it was supported by uh, 900 groups in all 50 states. And uh, I really do think we're on the brink of a clean energy revolution. Uh, we just have to commit ourselves uh, to doing it. And uh, um, this is kind of at the end of the march as people are celebrating. So if you aren't a member of our, one of our listservs, uh, and would like more information about fracking or like to know about the campaign work, uh, you can turn on your phone and um, text Fracopoly to that number. So I'm going to turn it over to Michelle, and then we'll both take questions. I'm going to leave the uh, mic so that the folks over webcast can hear me. Again, my name is Michelle Allen. I'm the Florida organizer here at Food and Water Watch. Um, I live in St. Pete now, but I am uh, a Georgia native. I moved to St. Pete about a year and a half ago, but I have been fighting for the clean energy revolution since I was still a, a student at Kennesaw State University in Georgia. Um, but really moved to Florida because I love this place. I think that Florida is one of the most beautiful states uh, in the nation, and I truly believe that the Everglades is some of the most marvelous wilderness that must be protected, not only because of its biodiversity, but also because of the services that it provides in providing us clean drinking water. But Food and Water Watch has been really at the front, uh, at the forefront of the fracking fight in Florida uh, since a well was fracked in Naples back uh, New Year's Eve of 2013. Um, to our knowledge, there has not been uh, any other fracking <coughs> events in Florida, uh, but there has been conventional drilling uh, for decades. And so we, we must assume that because fracking right now is legal and unregulated in Florida, that fracking could be occurring any time that uh, conventional drilling is. Um, in the last legislative session, we, Food and Water Watch, worked with uh, many of our partners across the state to defeat pro-fracking legislation that would have not only taken away local communities' rights to ban fracking, um, but would have also allowed the fracking companies to keep the chemicals that they use as a trade secret. Um, raise your hand if you made a phone call or wrote a letter or met with your legislator about the issue of fracking. Great. So a lot of folks in here. So because of the work of people mm -hmm. like you who reached out to your legislator, urged them to vote no on that pro-fracking legislation, we defeated it. 
which is awesome. Uh, and if legislation that is introduced uh, in the legislature in the next, the coming session, early next year, that would do anything less than ban fracking statewide, uh, we'll defeat that legislation too. And here locally, uh, Miami-Dade County is currently working to ban fracking locally. And we have worked with our partners across the state to pass 16 city and county-wide ordinances across the state um, that fracking won't occur there unless the state tries to preempt their, uh, their local control. So I think that's really exciting. Broward County is one of those counties. Uh, and like I said, we have been working with our partners, Urban Paradise Guild, who I'm excited are, are here this evening. They've really been on the forefront here in Miami-Dade working to make sure that uh, Miami-Dade County citizens are protected from the dangers of fracking. Um, and the county commission will be voting on that ordinance next month, right? Great. So either on October 4th or 18th, the county commission will take their final vote. And, and it looks right now that we're going to have an overwhelming yes by the commission. So, Great. 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 So, that, so once that ordinance passes, that means that fracking is prohibited from happening in Miami-Dade County. Yeah. Great. Perfect. So we'll ban fracking then, and then we'll go back and we'll ban the wastewater disposal as well, which is equally as important. It's great. Uh, but we are going to continue to work to pass local ordinances so that we protect local communities. And of course, like I said before, once the 2017 legislative uh, session comes up, uh, if fracking legislation is introduced, that would do anything less than ban it statewide. We're going to defeat that bill as well. Thanks. Think, hold on just one second, then we'll take questions. Okay, yeah, questions for Michelle or, or for me? Yeah. So now it means that they can dispose these waters as of yet, so they can hold them from other states and dispose them in Florida and Miami-Dade, unless there's another legislation against it. That's right, I think New York is, is figuring that out now, that New York banned fracking, but uh, fracking companies have been take, trucking waste fracking wastewater from Pennsylvania up to New York, uh, and so we, oh. yeah, just take it out. Yeah. So regardless of whether any area in Florida is at risk of fracking, if there is oil in the ground, any county, uh, every community in Florida is at risk of fracking uh, wastewater disposal if we bring fracking here. What is the risk of that when they insert it into the? Mm -hmm into the water system, we eventually get it in drinking, in rain, in other ways like that, and this is how those people get sick, this is all. Well, there's always the danger of some kind of contamination of the aquifer, and especially Florida is kind of a, has a very special geology that's much different than some of these other states. And of course, none of that has been taken into consideration. Okay. Um, wanted to point out that we've already had disposal of fracking fluids happen right here in Miami. They chose one of our lowest income areas, uh, Opelaka, as the disposal site, 200,000 gallons or more, I believe. Yeah, and that's from the Dan Hughes site that, uh, from 2013 uh, that Michelle was referring to. So that's why it's so important that we have several bans. One is the zoning ban to prevent the land use for fracking, and then there'll be an environment. Yeah. Yes. Um, you said there's one well in Florida, and that's the mention of the jobs, and you're saying fishing, so I have to say that the shale and sandstone jobs are kind of hard to fill. Right. The jobs in Florida. Does that mean that it doesn't work that well in Florida? Florida's only one well? And then the second question I have, does it work? There is fracking going on on the coast of California now. In fact, the Obama administration legalized it um, very quietly a few months ago. Um, you know, part of what goes on with fracking is there are these major companies, and then there are a lot of smaller companies that own mineral rights. And they often want to start the fracking, even if it's not... Uh, cost effective because that's how they can then sell uh, their shares to another company. 
there's a whole Ponzi scheme that's involved uh, with uh, these mineral rights. And actually, the, uh, the New York Times wrote about this, um, I think it was 2012, 2013, some of the concerns about what the financial services industry is doing. In fact, some of the uh, fracking that's gone on that some of the companies like Chesapeake is a company that was engaged in a lot of fraudulent behaviors, but a number of the uh, companies that aren't um, considered as um, using so much fraud, what they do, they, they want to frack, and then they bundle the, um, the mineral rights and they sell them. And a lot of these have been sold overseas, uh, or there are, are partnerships, many partnerships with uh, foreign com companies who want to uh, learn about the technology from the U.S. because uh, this technology is spreading around the world. So there are a number of different ways that companies make money um, beyond selling the oil or gas. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is Commissioner Levine Kava. She is the commissioner who um, introduced the ordinance and really has been a, a major ally uh, for us and Urban Paradise Guild. Are there any others that you want to mention? about the generalization of oil and gas or the grouping of it together. Um, he wasn't grasping the concept that it was the practice of extracting it, not necessarily the actual oil and gas. Um, and he decided to just walk out, to not vote on it. He yes, didn't want to vote against it, but he... Yeah, yeah, he didn't want to be against, which is actually a lot of unanimous vote. So it was interesting, but overall positive. Overall, it's been unanimous every time. Yes. So this might be a question I don't know if it's too general or whatever, but the top up is the office up there. So have they actually started drilling at all? Uh, a well out in some area where they're actually able to get the oil to come out or are they just basically the shallow or sluices and the aquifers that way? They have a little bit of experience. The aquifer is everywhere essentially underground and you know, we're standing on limestone, Florida is built on limestone which is very porous rock, water flows right through it, up, down, sideways. And uh, in fact, the water that we get underground, much of it is from the Florida aquifer, which starts up in the Carolinas and comes all the way down to South Florida. Uh, so any of these things are potentially vulnerable. They'll tell us that if you go deep enough underground, it won't mix upwards. I don't trust that. Uh, also, because we've got salt intrusion from sea level rise coming into the aquifer, it's, do we really need extra threats to our drinking water? It would just make no sense. So um, they've already done the Dan Hughes well, which she mentioned, uh, over on the west coast. Now they're setting up for seismic testing in the Cypress, which has been okayed by the National Park Service without an environmental impact study, which is just, it, it makes no sense. It, it is mind-boggling. So by blocking disposal here, we're hoping that that will stymie uh, uh, fracking in the Everglades. And overall, because we've got more population here than anywhere in Florida, that we can help essentially build this momentum. Because yeah. there are, what is it, is 78% of Florida's population or something like that lives in counties and cities where there's either a ban or a uh, resolution against fracking. There are 88 in all in 16 count or 16 yeah. counties and cities. Yeah, but it's what percentage of the population, which I think is very telling. It's around, it's yeah, 70 something yeah. percent. Yeah. So it's it's really huge, and so it's just so important that we do our part here. They're working with other communities all over Florida. There's Floridians against fracking, mm -hmm. which Food and Water Watch is a major leader on. It's it's been uh, a, it takes a village. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely does.
does. OK, we're going to get some questions from people who haven't asked one, and then I'll come back. Yes? Tell me if I have this right. The way I understand it, um, when fracking uses all this fresh water, mixes it with chemical and silica, and then um, this is just a fra fracture of an underground uh, rock that leads to gas. Okay. At best, if it's, if it's stored underground, injected underground, mm -hmm. and you know, let's just say it doesn't pollute any water, it's perfect. The case would never mm -hmm. break. Yes. Absolutely. And you'll often hear that fracking wastewater is recycled. So I'm going to say something about that. Because the industry will recycle it once, not for drinking water quality, but get enough of the caustic chemicals out that they can inject it again. And then that's the last time they can do it because it's so polluted. So yes, I mean, it's, it's really craziness. And um, you know, there are a lot of ways that the oil and gas industry and conventional drilling is overusing water, but this, this really goes above and beyond. And then at worst, it's going to actually get in the aquifer, ruin perfectly good water. That now yeah. We'll never be able to use that again. And we don't really know what happens to a lot of it because all of these new pathways are created. Depends on the geology, how much of the wastewater comes up. I mean, it can be. Um, it, it can be over 50, 60 percent of the wastewater that surges back under the well. It, com it completely depends on the, uh, on the geology. And then if it's in the evaporation pond and it evaporates, doesn't it then get mixed in with the rain? The rain well, you're left with sludge, uh, basically. The with the, yeah. Well, some of the volatile, it, it depends, the volatile chemicals can go up into the atmosphere. But, right, I mean, it, there are a lot of unknowns, too. I will say one thing that I forgot to say in my study is, you know, when we started, when we got into this battle, there was very little research on fracking. Today, um, there are more than 550 studies, and 85% of them have show impacts, major impacts from fracking, health, environmental, um, many different impacts. So, and those are peer-reviewed studies. Yeah. You're right. So Forgot to mention that. How they can make it effective here to, you know, to this point. So that's why it's without necessarily state. It's fracking with hydrochloric acid and other acids that they use. Yes. Have you seen any evidence that uh, fracking is changing over the time and matured? And whether you've been able to look at fracking as it operates and then whether it's sensitive? Well, you know, um, in places like Pennsylvania, it was really experimentation. So it was really, really extreme. Uh, a lot, and a lot of the problems there are, um, are really terrible. But I would not say that anywhere that fracking is going on, I mean, Colorado is the most fracked state. When there were uh, floods in the last couple of years, uh, there was fracking wastewater floating on the surface, going into all of the streams. I mean, this is how, what I learned, I didn't realize how, what a shoddy record the oil and gas industry had. I mean, I knew it was bad and was pretty cynical, but their, 
business model is doing things at, at as low a cost as possible and using contractors. So a lot of this fracking and a lot of the things they do is done with contractors that they may they may own as part of a multi, they could be part of their multinational corporation, but they're a separate company, or it could just just be a a contractor. A lot of the contractors are really fly by night, and the reason that they use this structure is for litigation. The other thing is that um, the oil and gas industry operates with uh, knowing that they're going to have a, a lot of um, deaths and injuries of workers and a lot of different uh, pollution accidents. So what happens when somebody has an accident, this does pertain to your question, when there's an accident like, um, well, Pennsylvania, it's very dramatic for us because we worked with a lot of the impacted people. Once uh, their lawyer makes a settlement, because it never goes to court, uh, almost never goes to court, very infrequently. Once there is a settlement made, and usually at a low amount of money, the, the impacted people have to write, uh, have to sign a disclosure agreement and can't ever talk about it in public again. So what we see is, it's not that there are fewer accidents, it's just that there's hush money being paid. And you know, you have to understand where these people are at. I mean, their lives have been wrecked. You can't expect that they're you know, not going to take the money and run. Um, and so it makes it even more difficult to really talk about uh, their record because so much of it is hidden. Yes. Um, I Folks, I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt the uh, questioning. We, we will continue. I just, we're over our time on our okay. live stream. So I'll say goodnight to the live stream audience. We can continue the questions after they go. But uh, don't forget to give us a call. We'll get a book signed. Also, uh, Winona's other book, Foodopoly. We have this for sale as well. So we say good night to the live stream audience. Sorry you missed out for the rest of the questions, but the rest of you can continue on. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>